Church is one of the Times Square Church pulpit series. It was recorded in the sanctuary of Times Square Church in Manhattan, New York City. Other tapes are available by writing World Challenge, P.O. Box 260, Lindale, Texas, 75771, or calling 903-963-8626. None of these messages are copyrighted, and you are welcome to make copies for free distribution to friends. The message I'm going to preach this morning, I'm afraid, will cause maybe just a handful of people that hear it to never come back to this church again. Now, folks, it's not a laughing matter. I mean it. I'm not trying to be theatrical. It's because what I preach about, I know to be a fact that there are some people in, still in this body who come to the Times Square Church are involved in what I'm talking about because they've tried to ha- they have handed me tapes and books, and I, I know that they're involved in the kind of thing I want to expose this morning under the help of the Holy Ghost. I want to talk to you about the reproach of the solemn assembly. Now that's a long title, but you'll see it very clearly. I want you to go to Zephaniah, the third chapter. Zephaniah, the third chapter. I'm going to give you time to find it. Okay. If you get to Haggai, you've gone too far, and you get to Mike and Habakkuk, go one more chapter, and you are in Zephaniah. Now, folks, this is serious business this morning. I want you to pray that the Lord give me the brokenness to preach it the way he wants it preached, not out of arrogance, but out of brokenness before the Lord. There's something that's burning in my heart. Now, I've been asking God to let me deal with this for a long time, and he's released me to do so this morning. The 18th verse, chapter 3, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 18. There's an amazing prophecy by the prophet Zephaniah. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Heavenly Father, I know that you have burned this into my soul, but I, I've got to have a broken spirit and a contrite nature that this is not preached in any kind of arrogance, our self-centeredness, but Lord, that you are trying to accomplish a purpose this morning. I ask you to anoint me in a special way. Let the fire of God come forth this morning and ignite the word of the living God. And don't let any of us, anybody in this building, try to put away or, or just to put off what is being heard and spoken here from this pulpit this morning. Lord, I'm asking give me the courage to speak it rightly and boldly. And I pray, Lord, that you, you, you deal with any of these issues that are in this church this morning that we're dealing with, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee, to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Now, this is a dual prophecy by Zephaniah. It has to do with the children of Israel. That's Jerusalem and also with spiritual Zion, which is the church of Jesus Christ in the last day. First of all, he was speaking to Jews that God was going to dis- uh, gather together, had been dispersed to all the nations. But he was only going to bring back those who had a broken heart for the sad condition of Israel, who carried a burden for restoration, who blushed over the sins of God's apostate people. And he would remember all who carried the reproach, all the shame, all of the blasphemy, all of the horrible things that were going on in God's house, those who carried the burden from it, of it, all those who were sorrowful and grieving in heart over the condition of the body, he said, I'm going to gather you. And he made great promises to these, and I'll show you what those are in a moment. But this prophecy 
is primarily to the church of Jesus Christ in the last day, to the solemn assembly. Now, in the Old Testament, the children of Israel were called to their festivals for seven days. And on the eighth day was called a solemn assembly. That was when they met especially together, putting everything aside in focused worship and praise to the Heavenly Father. The scripture says, on the eighth day you shall have a solemn assembly. And you'll find this solemn assembly all through the Old Testament representing the congregation that is separated unto God, meeting to meet the Lord. This is the church of Jesus Christ in the last day. Now, according to Zephaniah, the house of God in the last days is going to be under reproach. And the Hebrew word here means shame and disgrace. There's going to be shame and disgrace in the house of God. Now, we're not talking about the backslidden, liberal, modern church. I'm not talking about the kind of church in San Francisco called Glide Memorial United Methodist Church. That's recently taken the cross down because they said, Jesus isn't all of us, and we are the cross. It's a church that glorifies homosexuality and abortion, and it is an it is absolute church, an apostate church. I'm not talking about churches where the minister doesn't believe in Christ anymore, doesn't believe in heaven, doesn't believe in hell. I'm not talking about that apostate church, the, the metropolitan community church, the homosexual denomination. I'm not talking about that church. Folks, some of the worst blasphemy in the world is not coming from atheists. It's coming from the pulpits and the pens of backslidden, ungodly preachers. We're not talking about that kind of church. That is not the solemn assembly. So save your grief. I, I, don't, I don't shed a tear. I have no burden for that kind of church. The Lord said on the judgment day, He's going to deal with that church. We can pray for them, but we're not to spend any of our grief on that which is not really the church. Now, God is looking, the scripture says, according to Zephaniah, God is looking for a people who will sorrow and grieve over the reproach that is being uh, fostered on the church of Jesus Christ in these last days. I'm talking about the church that was born at Pentecost. I'm talking about the church that was born in the teaching of the apostle Paul and the apostles. The church born in the doctrine of the Godhead of Jesus Christ. That church, that born-again church is under attack. That born-again church is suffering reproach. It's been prophesied that in this day of reproach, of shame and disgrace, God is going to raise up a holy remnant who are going to grieve and weep over this defilement. A people to whom the reproach of it has become to them a burden. I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly. God said, I'm going to have a remnant who are not just going to sit idly by while all of these things invade the church. I'm going to have a people that are not going to be satisfied to go their merry way and just ignore what is happening as charlatans and money-mad prophets, false prophets are coming into the house of God and destroying everything in sight. He said, no, I'm going to gather a people who grieve over this. I'm going to have a people who take it as a burden. They're not going to be complacent anymore. If you truly love the Lord and you love his church, you cannot look honestly at what's happening today. And I'm going to name these reproaches this morning. And if after you hear what I have to say about this reproach, and you can walk out of this church and you can say, well, I, I just stand on, on Matthew the 18th chapter, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. I'm not going to worry about it. God has everything under control. That's not enough. God uses people. God uses people to perform his work. He doesn't send angels. Angels weep over it, but God doesn't use angels to accomplish his purposes. He uses burdened, broken-hearted, weeping men and women. The prophet Joel cried out, Call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of the Lord your God, and cry unto the Lord, Alas, for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand, as a destruction from the Almighty shall it come. 
Joel was saying, judgment is at the door. Jesus is coming. The day of the Lord is at hand. Wake up, elders. Wake up, pastors. Wake up, shepherds. Take a look at the church. Get the burden. Carry it. Now, why should we take on the burden of the reproach of the solemn assembly? Joel said, because there's a rotten seed being planted. A gospel is being preached that is withering everything that's in sight. Everything that's green and godly and pure is being withered. He said, the seed is rotten under the clods. The corn is withered. The storehouses of the right gospel is barren and desolate. There's a famine of hearing the pure word of the Lord. The cattle, in other words, the sheep, the, the congregation are perplexed because there's no pasture. The flocks are desolate and hungry. The rivers are drying up. A strange fire is devouring the pastures. And if you listen to Ezekiel, he's saying it's shepherds who are trampling down the good pasture and eating the best for themselves. Joel 2.15, he cries, gather together the congregation, the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and sorrow. Get the burden, cry, pray. Oh God, spare your people. Give not your holy church to reproach. Don't let the heathen rule over your flock. Now what is this reproach of the solemn assembly? What are these shameful, disgraceful things that are happening in the church of Jesus Christ today? First of all, it's the rotten seed that's being preached by covetous shepherds. This is known as the prosperity gospel. This is one of the greatest reproaches the church of Jesus Christ ever perpetrated since Christ. This perverted gospel is poisoning multitudes even in China, Africa, and all over the world. It's an American gospel invented and spread by rich American evangelists and pastors. Rich. And it alarms me that so many people can hear the tapes and see the videos that are they're coming out of these prosperity conferences and not weep over them and not get the burden for what is happening to the church. This poison is spread all over the world. Cuba is about to open and they are itching to get in there right now with their prosperity gospel to tell you've been poor enough now God wants all Cubans to be rich. This past week I was given a videotape Recently recorded, I think, in, in this past January, in Kenneth Copeland's meetings. And I listened to the speakers, and I was dumbfounded. Folks, you read the New Testament, you'll find Paul the Apostle named those who they, he believed were false prophets. He warned and he named their names. And I'm telling you now, I want to, if you can listen to what I'm about to tell you and not be grieved, then you're blind. You're spiritually blind. You have a hard heart. You know what a hard heart is in Hebrew? A heart with a shield on it. So that the gospel, the pure gospel, cannot penetrate it. It's been so, the mind has been so uh, saturated with this unbalanced gospel that you cannot come to many of them. You cannot preach the truth. You cannot show them anything else in the scripture because they have a shield over their hearts. Hard-hearted. And some of you will not receive, receive it. And if, if you've been feeding your soul on Copeland's tapes or Hagen's tapes, you're not going to like what you hear. But folks, I'm a shepherd. I've been called by God and I made this church a promise. As long as we're in this... Now listen, no clapping. Folks, please. Please don't clap. I made this church and this body a promise. As long as we're in this pulpit, if we saw wolves in sheep's clothing coming to rob the flock, we would stand up and cry out against it. Now, it's up to you to do something about it. And I say this with a broken heart. But I sat this week and I listened to the speakers in this conference and I was so shocked. I was so hurt, weeping. The burden of the Lord came on me. That's why I'm preaching this message. I grieve over it. Let me tell you, I quote word for word what was said. First of all, all the speakers could hardly get by because people were running up stuffing their pockets with money. And the reason they do that is a new doctrine that just come out 
that says if you want to be blessed, you have to find the most blessed evangelist or pastor you can find because he that has been given much receiveth much. He that has little, even that which he's been taken, has will be taken from him. You find the most blessed and prosperous preacher and you give him money, you will be blessed. And the more blessed he is if you give to those that are most blessed. It's a pyramid scheme. If these men were in the secular world, they'd be in jail. Ponzi schemes, pyramid schemes, the man at the top who appears to be the holiest, godliest and speaks the loudest. Hundreds of people running up until the pockets were bulging. And the sinner says, is this the free gospel? Is this the gospel? Dollar bills? Listen to what was said. The speaker got up. And he said, if a poor widow on welfare hands you five dollars, you better take it. Elijah took the widow's last meal. You are the anointed one. You deserve it. You take it. The same speaker said, I live in an eight thousand dollar I, I live in an eight thousand square foot house. I'm going to build a bigger one now, one that King Solomon would be proud of. I just paid fifteen thousand dollars for a dog. You see this gorgeous ring on my finger? I was in Jamaica and just paid thirty two thousand dollars for it. And he said, I want you to know that when the people in my town come past my mansion. And they see my Rolls Royce standing, sitting in the driveway. They know there's a God in heaven. Now you tell me that's the gospel. You tell me you can't weep over that. One of the speakers got up and see, we, he said, we made a covenant along with Brother Copeland. That for the next year, 365 days, none of us are going to suffer for a single day. We will not know a moment of discouragement. We will never be sick or in need. We're going to enjoy all the blessings. We reject all suffering, all pain, all financial problems. That's fine if you're on the top of the heap. Here's... What grieves me most, this was preached. The Holy Spirit can't be poured out upon you until first you're in the money flow. Until you are prospering, the Holy Ghost cannot do His work. Think of it. How does this affect you? What does it do to your spirit when you see poor people who are living from paycheck to paycheck? And, the, and suddenly he says, run for the money. And people are running wild, wildly everywhere, running. And they say as they run, they are claiming the riches. And then I see people withering like snakes out of their seats on the floor. I see the evangelists going up going, like a snake and people falling everywhere folks what's going on reproach of the solemn assembly you know what the prophet called them he said they're greedy dogs ungodly watchmen Folks, if you had the heart of God and the burden of the Lord, you'd be crying out with Isaiah. They are blind watchmen, ignorant, dumb dogs, sleeping, loving to slumber. Yea, greedy dogs which can never have enough. I've got 8,000 square foot, but I'm going to sell it and I'm going to make one now that King Solomon could live in. Never getting enough. He said, shepherds that cannot understand... They all look to their own way, every one for his own gain from his quarter. Jeremiah spared no words. He said, my people are lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. Go to Ezekiel 34, please. Go to Ezekiel 34. I'm telling you, listen. You say, Pastor, you have no right to speak so strongly on this subject. If you think I'm strong, you listen to Ezekiel. 
Ezekiel 34. Verse 1 through 10, verses 1 through 10, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy, say to them, Thus saith the Lord God to the shepherds, Woe to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flock? You eat the fat. He's talking to shepherds. You eat the fat and you clothe you with the wool. Yeah, you take your the five dollars from the widow and you buy a fifteen thousand dollar dog. You take the paycheck from the widow and the poor and you tell them that they don't have enough faith, that's why they're not prospering. And you feed, you take the very wool off the back of the sheep. The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick, neither have you bound up that which is broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which is lost. You're not out for souls, you're out for money. But with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. They've scattered because there's no shepherd and they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. My flock was scattered to the face of the earth and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and fed not the flock. Therefore, O you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them any more. If it takes any person to do it, and God bankrupts it all, he'll do it. I'm going to deliver my flock from the teeth of these men. My God, help us. Number two, the misrepresentation of the blessed Holy Ghost. What a reproach. This is the worst reproach. It should make us fall on our faces. The way and the manner in which the Holy Ghost is being represented to the whole world. Sad to say, there's so little discernment left in the church and among so many pastors and even church leaders, they don't even know when the Holy Ghost is being misrepresented or blasphemed. There are thousands of Christians that go to church, you go to crusades and healing crusades, and, and they see things they think of the Holy Ghost, and they don't even know that they're sitting on the ministry, they're clapping and they're praising God while a man stands up there blaspheming and misrepresenting the Holy Ghost, and they don't even know it. Entire charismatic denominations, including the assemblies of God, are being torn apart. Literally be torn apart by, uh, by pseudo revivals. All kinds of things that are happening and, and there's something new being introduced almost every week. And, and the leaders don't know whether to embrace it or to curse it. They don't know what to do. Pastors write us, we get letters from hundreds and hundreds of pastors from all over the world. They say what is right and what is wrong. Where are the leaders? Where is somebody to tell us? Folks, what we're seeing today in what is called so many revivals and things that are happening being attributed to the Holy Ghost cannot be found in the Scripture. Anything that cannot be found in this book has to be rejected outright. Has to be rejected. Totally rejected. I weep when I see these videos that are sent to me from all over the country. Whole groups of bodies jerking out of control, falling on the floor, laughing hysterically, staggering around like drunkards, writhing like snakes, howling like wild animals. And we have evangelists that stand and blows on people.
to knock him down. As if the breath of the Holy Ghost has now incarnated him. Throws his Brioni jacket at people and says, that is the hand of the Lord. And now a new gospel has just hit South America. Now, folks, it's very rude and crude, but I have to tell you, the newest thing now, because, folks, when you get into this kind of thing, when you get away from the parameters of the Scripture, when, when, when you just get up and say, oh, it's a new thing, it's a new thing, God's doing a new thing. I don't understand it. It's not in the Scripture, but I don't want to, I don't want to stand against the Holy Ghost. Folks, if it's not in this book, you must stand up against it. And now the new thing is that you can't enter the kingdom of God except you should come as a little babe. And now they're asking, their, and the people come with diapers under their outer clothing so that they can defecate and urinate in the meetings. This is the new thing. Folks, where does it end? Like Pastor Simbla, I heard him preach the other day. He said, is it come down to this that one day some evangelist stands up and says, I've got a revelation from the Lord. It's time to add Mary to your worship. That's what it's going to come to. An evangelist calls himself the Holy Ghost bartender. He says, belly up to the bar and take a drink of the Holy Ghost. And they call that drinking the new wine. And folks, I hear ringing in my ears the prophet that said, The day of the Lord is at hand. Wickedness abounds. Weep between the porch and the altar. Put on sackcloth fast and mourn for the backsliding of my people. Jesus is about to come and the masses are unreached. And when I see Christians barely up to what is called the Holy Ghost bar, staggering like drunkards, Job, Joel's words come to me loud and clear. Awake, you drunkards, and weep, all you who are drinking new wine, because the harvest of the field is perished. He said, souls are dying by the thousands. All over the world, people are dying. What are you laughing about? Folks, anything that is of the Holy Ghost has to work anywhere on the face of the earth. You've got to be able to take it into the most most vile, wicked places. You've got to take it into poverty nations. You've got to take it into the dregs of humanity. And it's got to work there. It can't work just in prosperous America. It has to work everywhere on the face of the earth. I dare you. I dare these men. And I sat lovingly. I dare them to take this gospel. I dare them to take the laughing gospel into the Balkans now. And go into those refugee camps where wives are crying because they saw their husbands shot. Their daughters have been raped. Their children are hungry. They've lost their homes. They're homeless. And go in there and ask them to belly up to the bar. The Holy Ghost wants you to laugh. And this so-called revival is coming to Madison Square Garden this summer. Knowing what you know about the scripture, carrying the grief and the burden for the solemn assembly, how do you even conceive of embracing such a doctrine? Let me tell you who's laughing. The world, the ungodly, the heathen. It's become a spectacle. In a time so close to the coming of the Lord, when the church of Jesus Christ ought to be shut and lay in a secret closet of prayer, where there ought to be weeping for the lost, where there ought to be a desire to forsake all and follow Jesus, where there should never be a mention of the dollar bill, the American God, the American idolatry. We have the world looking at this foolishness. And you know what they're thinking now? That the Holy Ghost is a circus. The Holy Ghost is the ringmaster. And it's a charismatic circus. I don't care what anybody thinks anymore. 
I don't care if people drop off the mailing list. I do care for their soul. I care for, for the fact that many are into this blindness. But I have a duty before God to stand before the congregation He's called me to minister to and warn you and tell you that these are reproaches of the solemn assembly. And the Bible said you're to be sorrowful about it. He said the elders are to be sorrowful about it. The congregation, the pastors, the ministers, the evangelists. And we should be praying down these strongholds. And finally, the reproach of downgrading depravity in the church. Downgrading depravity. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness. They put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Jeremiah 23, 15. I've seen in the prophets a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers. And none returns from his wickedness. I got a letter. Let me explain. Let me illustrate. I got a letter this past week from an irate Christian woman. Terribly irate. She said, my husband, who's supposed to be a Christian, is a big time gambler in the millions. She said, I've been so concerned with the crowd with it. And, 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 and the danger he's in. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll urge him to go to the pastor. She said, Brother Wilson, you'll not believe what happened. She said, I am so angry. I'm so hurt and confused. I sent my multi-million dollar gambling husband to my pastor. He said, he had heard about this man, been in the church. I don't know if he was enjoying the tithing of it or what. But he said, I have searched the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, and I can't find one thing in the scripture against gambling. He said, I see no sin in it. He said, enjoy yourself. Words to that effect. She said, she was dumbfounded. She said, how can a man of God say such a thing to my husband? She intimated that he, she just lost him for good. This is exactly what Jeremiah spoke of. The pastor strengthened the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. And, and he explains why that they have downgraded depravity in their congregation and why they're calling evil good and good evil and bitter sweet and sweet bitter. In the reason of it, he said the prophets themselves are committing adultery and walking in lies. He said there's any man that's got sin in his life is not going to get up and talk about sin in the camp. Because he's convicted by his own adultery and his own sin, his own evil mind. Folks, I'm not painting every minister in the country with this brush. No, the majority of ministers are on fire for God. There, there are young ministers so clean and so pure in this wicked day and age. I've met many of them, and I thank God for them. Even in this town, even in this city, I've met some of the most righteous preachers I've ever met in my lifetime. And multitudes of ministers feel just like I feel this morning. And they're looking and waiting for voices to expose that which is evil. If they had stood in my counsel, if they had, and it caused my people to hear my words. And they said, if they were speaking what I really have in my heart, if they were speaking the mind of God, they should have turned the people away from their evil ways and from evil of their doings. He said, you can tell a man of God. You can tell if a man knows the Lord and they have been shut in with God. God said these other, I didn't send them, I didn't speak to them. They speak their own mind out of their own imagination. Out of the evil of their own hearts, the prophet said. They spake a vision of their own heart. I sent them not. I have not spoken to them. They say unto them that despise me, the Lord said, you shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walks after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Don't worry, everything's okay. It used to be that sinful men who wanted... To appease their conscience went to the psychiatrist. Now they go to certain churches.
I believe like the Puritan, the godly, holy Puritan pastors who said this, and I quote one, that a godly person has to be more deeply concerned, more burdened over the reproach of the church than any other evil in the world. The reproach upon the solemn assembly should be the greatest sorrow to everyone who loves Christ and his church. This should be the greatest sorrow in our heart, these reproaches on his name and on his church. Now, you may be saying, well, Pastor Dave, I just don't see it that way. I'm, I'm of a more positive mental attitude. Uh, Pastor Dave, you, you've got that morbid, prophetic kind of thing like the Old Testament prophets. And this may be your thing, but it's not my thing because I see things through brighter eyes. I see the church, uh, the great blessings come. All oh, folks, I, I believe God's going to bless his church. I believe the gates of hell will never prevail against it. I know all of that. I believe with all of my heart. But what do I do about this scripture? What do I do about the prophet Zephaniah who said in the last days, God's going to raise up a people and gather them together and they're going to have a sorrowful heart over the conditions and they are going to bear the reproach. They're going to take the reproach of Christ. They're going, they're going to know the heart of God. And I dare you get into the presence of God. You shut yourself in with the Lord with diligent prayer and he's going to burn your heart. You're going to weep over the condition of the church. He's going to show you the condition. He will open your eyes to it. Who is this blind but my servant or deaf? Is the messenger that I sent. They see many things, but they never do observe. They, in other words, they, they don't do anything about it. He said, you don't even hear. Now, folks, I want to show you a scripture that I, I didn't understand until this past week when the Lord put this message on my heart. Go to Zephaniah again. The third chapter. I'm going to close here in just a moment. I want to prove to you, look this way for just a minute. I want to prove to you that this matter of taking on the burden of the reproach of the Solomon sent me is so close to the heart of God. It is so much his mind. I, I fought demonic powers to get to this pulpit this morning and preach this. I had the devil hound me and saying, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to make you pay for this. Your health, your family and everything else. I listened to a hundred lies. And had to overcome them through faith. I'd be under attack. But I want you to know that I am on such powerful scriptural grounds. That I'm telling you that right now, while I'm preaching, the Lord Jesus himself is rejoicing and dancing. And when you take your stand, when you take on this burden of the Lord... And you take on that burden by fasting and praying over it. You, our weapons are mighty through God and pulling down strong. These are strongholds in the church. You've got to stand up. We need to do it corporately. We need to do it privately. Every child of God needs to be praying against this. That God would first open the eyes of those prophets, false prophets who are preaching this. Open their eyes. Deliver them from this snare. And be merciful to them. Be kind to them. And that everybody's in this snare be delivered. We need to be praying that down more, more than that. Don't touch it. Don't go near it. Leave it alone because it will grab you if you're not strong in the Lord. If you're a weak believer, you're a new believer, you go in just out of curiosity. It'll take you. It'll grab you because it appeals to everything of the flesh. And until you, until you know how to deal with the flesh and the power of the Holy Ghost, stay away from it. The Bible says grief is the daughter of love. I, I mean, uh, the Puritan said, grief is the daughter of love. In other words, if you really love Jesus, you're going to share his grief. But let me show you the scripture, verse 17. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Why? Because he's gathered them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly who are of thee to whom the reproach was a burden. He's singing over those who share his burden. I stand before you now on a rock. Without one iota of fear in me. 
I have delivered the mind of God. And I tell you now in the power of this wonderful word from the prophet Jeremiah. The Lord thy God in the midst of these mighty, he will save thee, rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. Why? Because he's found a people who are sorrowful over the things that sorrows his heart. Who carry the burden that he carries of the reproach of the solemn assembly. I tell you in closing, with everything in me, you and I need to be praying that God will raise up leaders. He'll raise up voices, fearless voices, heartbroken voices that have nothing to prove. Stand up against this because where it's going to end, let me tell you where it's going to end. Unless we begin to pray and get a hold of this burden, let me tell you where it ends with this, I'll close. It's going to end in a love trap. A love trap. Where, and, and, and this is what they're saying now. Uh, you'll hear these people, it sounds so loving. We love everybody. It doesn't matter what you preach. It doesn't matter whether you're in prosperity. It doesn't matter what, what your gospel is or anything else. God is love. Let's all just get together and embrace one another. But the Bible said, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? How can, you, how can you walk with those when you don't agree with the unscriptural practices? You cannot. That's a love trap. They say, don't condemn anybody. Don't judge anybody. Oh, no, no, no. That's what the Bible says. He said, we're to judge righteous judgment. Reprove and rebuke with all long suffering. I'm not on a soapbox. I'm on a rock. God's trying to save you, church. I don't know what they do with this scripture when Jesus said to one of the churches of Asia, he said, I know you're so poor, but you're really rich. What were the riches of God in Christ Jesus? The peace of God, the wisdom of God, the nearness of Christ, all that is in Christ is ours. One of the pastors, not of this convention I mentioned, he tried to tell the congregation that that seamless robe of Jesus was one of the most expensive robes you could buy. Isn't that something? Even bring Jesus in to the doctrine. Folks, beware. Beware. Have I scared you? Are you ready? Are you ready to take on the burden of the Lord? You can't do that in your own flesh. You have to do as I've done. I've gone alone with God. And I said, Lord, tell me what hurts you. I want to feel your pain. You know we preach a lot of love and grace and mercy in this church. The time has come now to call a solemn assembly. Will you stand? Let me tell you what the invitation is about this morning. In the annex and all of the overflow rooms and here in the main auditorium all around me. I'm going to ask this body, if, if Times Square Church is your church, and if you believe what I've preached this morning, if you've got any of these tapes or books, get them out of your house. Don't give them away, burn them. Burn them. No clapping, please. Somebody invites you to go to these things, say, I'm sorry. I don't want a famine of the word, and I don't want my heart to wither and dry. I want the pure word of the Lord that will cause me to grow. I don't want anything, I don't want any message that's going to appeal to my flesh. Or to foster covetousness in my spirit. 
Some of you are here right now and say, Brother Wilson, I, I'm suffering financially and I, I need help. I need a miracle. Oh, God does supply needs and God is a miracle working God. Yes. But he's going to do it only his way. Not by misappropriating and not by misusing the scripture. Not by taking it out of context. But preaching a balanced message. You're not going to just look at all the rich men in the Old Testament. You know, I, I, I listened to them. Job was rich. Abraham was rich. Solomon was rich. David was rich. These are all rich men in the Old Testament. Well, take a look at Samuel on his donkey. Take a look at other men. And then listen to, listen to Abraham. He says, I'm not, I don't want any of this. He said, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. I don't want a big house down here. I don't want all these things. I'm looking to get home. I'm looking to be with my Savior and my Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Heavenly Father, you have truly borne me up this morning. Otherwise, I'd have been weak kneed and not been able to stand. And I thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord, if there's been one word I've spoken out of order, forgive me and cleanse me. But Lord, I thank you for the word. I believe in my heart that you rejoice when we take a stand against those things that grieve your heart. Things that are so contrary to the word of the Lord and contrary to scripture. Lord, if we get away from the scripture, we're on dangerous ground. Lord, keep us in the word. Keep us fastened to the word of God. Let us dig deep in it until we have discernment. We know what's right. We know what's wrong. Hallelujah. Lord, give us pastors and shepherds who will take a stand and keep their flock, Lord, from being swallowed up by wolves in sheep's clothing. Now, I'm going to give an invitation this morning for those who, first of all, are backslidden heart. You say, Pastor Dave, I don't have the fire burning in my heart. Now, if I preach the word of the Lord this morning, he'll confirm it. And the way he confirms it by bringing conviction to your heart. First of all, convict you on the word that you heard. If, if you have been lusting after gospel that would give you the keys to get rich or to be prosperous, I'm telling you, you need to repent. If you've been, have your heart's been going out to that kind of thing. I've, I've tried everything. I've tried faith, everything. I, I, I've got to get something in my hand now to teach me or show me how to get money. If money is the object, prosperity has been the object, you have missed the cross. You've missed the gospel. You've got to repent. And I want you to step out of your seat boldly and come up here and repent and say, God, forgive me. I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. I'm going to cross. And come what may, I'm not going to go that way. Now, if you're here in the balcony, the same thing. If you're backslidden in heart, you say, Pastor Wilson, Brother Dave, the fire is not burning in my soul like it should. You may be visiting here for the first time. We've had a number walk out. I'm sorry for that. But you're here. And God is doing something. And sometimes still waters run the deepest. And he's doing a deep work in our heart of conviction and speaking to us. He's speaking to me. To get rid of my timidity and speak prophetically when he speaks and not to be ashamed to expose what is evil. I'm asking everybody in this congregation, you're not right with God. There's been a coldness in your heart or you're not saved. I want you to call, follow these that are coming right now. And in, in the annex, I want you to simply walk right forward to the front where the screens are. We're going to have people take you in a room and pray with you and minister to you. And here in the main auditorium, while we sing a chorus, I want you to get out of your seat, wherever you're at. Say, Brother Wilkson, I don't want to be deceived by the devil. There may be other kinds of deceptions. Somebody talking to you on the phone, other deceptions. Somebody been trying to either gossip to you or speak some word of death into your ears and your heart and your mind. So, God, I don't receive this. I come now and I repent. Give me clean ears. Give me a clean heart. If there's sin in your life that's bound you, say, Brother Wilson, I want to be free from this sin that's in my life. Nobody needs to know what it is. No one will say anything crazy to you. No one will put a microphone in your face. You come because the Holy Ghost draws you all over this house. And in the annexes, if you're in the 
the overflow rooms go into the main annex, go into the main auditorium in the annex and join those that just move forward to the screens. There's uh, Pastor Neil Rhodes, I believe, is going to be there and others to, to show you where to go. But here in the main auditorium, up in the balcony, go this way and this way and down here in the main auditorium. Just step out of your seat and follow these that are coming now. The Lord wants to change your life. He wants the miracle in your life that you've been praying for. A freedom and deliverance from lust. Freedom and deliverance from false doctrine. And strengthen you in the Lord. If you feel you're weak this morning and need to be strengthened by the Holy Ghost, follow these that are coming, please. Listen, you that have come forward, just listen for a moment. The Holy Spirit's here to meet every need that's in your life. Every need in your body, soul, and spirit. He's here to minister to you. I can't minister to you. The Holy Spirit has to do that. Look at me for just a moment. Look this way. The Holy Spirit has to do the work. And He's here. He's willing. And He's waiting right now for you to give Him your confidence and your faith. That's all He's asking of you right now. To believe that if you confess your sins, the Lord will forgive you. To believe that He hears the cry of your heart. That sincere desire to follow Him. If you'll cry out now for power to live the overcoming life, he will give you that power. That's the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit. The Bible said he who has begun a good work in you will finish it. He'll continue it and he'll finish it to the day of the Lord. He's going to keep you till Jesus comes, in other words. Isn't that wonderful? He's going to, can you say that to yourself? You're going to keep me till Jesus comes. The Holy Ghost is going to keep me till Jesus comes. I want you to pray this with me from, from the innermost part of your being. Pray it. Those in the annex and those here in the auditorium. Pray this with me. Right out loud. Jesus, I come to you now in my need. I can't solve my problems. I can't forgive myself. I can't change myself. But you can change me. You can forgive me. You can give me a new heart. Lord, I confess that I need you. I confess that I can't make it on my own. And I give you my heart, my sins, my doubts, my backslidings, my lust. I give it all. Now, Holy Spirit, I believe the word. The word tells me that if I will believe and call on the Holy Ghost, he will come and inhabit my body and give me power to live for Christ and to overcome the dominion of sin. I believe and I receive. Now in the name of the Lord Jesus, I am secure in Christ according to his holy word. Now let me pray for you. Father, I pray that you break the chains that bind. I come against every spirit of lust, every habit that is evil, everything unlike you, Jesus, preoccupation with self, and Lord, I come against false doctrines. I come against those doctrines that lay hold of the mind that cause people to believe a lie to be the truth. I bind that in the name of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, take down the shield that has covered the hard hearts. And Lord, soften their hearts. Give them a heart of flesh. Let the sword of the Lord and the arrows of the truth penetrate their heart and bring healing. Take out the poison of the system now, Lord. And Father, we pray for your church. Lord, we know that you're going to prevail. We know there's going to be a glorious church come forth without spot or wrinkle. We know the devil will never defeat the purposes, God's eternal purposes. But Lord Jesus, give us the burden of the Lord. Let us carry this burden because you said, I will gather them that sorrow for these things. Lord, and we ask you for that godless sorrow. And even in sorrow, we rejoice. We have that rejoicing because we know that you're going to prevail against all that is unlike you in your house. Lord, we love your church because it is you. It is your body and we love it and we pray for it. And Lord, we will stand with you in it. God, give this church that burden, we pray. Let Times Square Church be a church that carries the burden of the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Give the Lord thanks right now in your heart. Just give him thanks. Ooh. This is the conclusion of the tape. 
This is the conclusion of the tape. This is the conclusion of the tape. This is the conclusion of the tape. This is the conclusion of the tape. This is the conclusion of the tape.